We have to build technology that doesn't let a human mistake be the total point of failure. And we have to rely on continual training, which is hard to let them know the patterns, to be able to spot them. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CyberWire's Hacking Humans podcast, where each week we look behind the social engineering scams, phishing schemes, and criminal exploits that are making headlines and taking a heavy toll on organizations around the world. I'm Dave Bittner from the CyberWire, and joining me is Joe Kerrigan from the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute. Hello, Joe. Hi, Dave. We've got some interesting stories to share this week, and later in the show, we have my interview with Michael Coates. He is the former Chief Information Security Officer at Twitter, and he was also Head of Security at Mozilla. These days, he heads up a company called Altitude Networks. It's an interesting interview. But first, a word from our sponsors at Know Before. Step right up and take a chance. Yes, you there. Give it a try and win one for your little friend there. Which were the most plausible subject lines in phishing emails? Don't be shy. Were they A, my late husband wished to share his oil fortune with you, or B, please read important message from HR, or C, a delivery attempt was made, or D, take me to your leader. Stay with us and we'll have the answer later, and it will come to you courtesy of our sponsors at Know Before, the security awareness experts who enable your employees to make smarter security decisions. And we are back, Joe. Before we get to our stories, we've got some quick follow-up. Uh, okay. A listener named Richard wrote in, and he said, this is a follow-up on our, our previous conversations about YubiKeys mm-hmm. and iOS devices. Richard wrote in, he said, Hello, I want to write in to let you know that there is a workaround to using YubiKey with iOS before the official Lightning YubiKey is released. If you purchased a standard YubiKey and configure it on a standard PC, you can then purchase the Lightning to USB 3 camera adapter, and then plug the YubiKey into the USB port on the adapter. I have tested this with our systems at work and have had success without requiring any additional work. Well, thank you, Richard. Right. Yeah, that's good. I think this is a great workaround. This is wonderful. I would still like to see the Lightning YubiKey come out so that you don't have to do this workaround. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to see that come out a little faster. Well, in these days, I mean, the rumors are that perhaps the next round of iPhones will just go to USB 3. Oh. So Apple's going to solved. go to a standard? <laughs> <laughs> problem solved. We'll see. Not going to go know. to their own proprietary solution. I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. So who knows? Might be a short-term thing. But at any rate, Richard, thanks for uh, writing in. Yeah, That's thanks for the heads up. Good information. Joe, why don't you kick things off with stories this week? Dave, you know I like my stories dark. <laughs> Yes, you do. And this is probably the <laughs> darkest story we've ever covered Okay, on Hacking Humans. So this comes from Safiya Sami Ali at NBC News. Okay. We'll put a link in the show notes. But you know what catfishing is, right? Yeah, go on. It's when you completely fabricate a social media profile and then use that to exploit your victims. Okay. Usually, the persona is completely fictitious. Sometimes it's stolen identities, but usually it's fictitious. And in this case... It's a terrible story that comes out of Alaska and Indiana. There's a guy named Darren Schillmiller, who is 21 from Indiana, and he created a fake online persona as a millionaire from Kansas. Hmm. And he called himself Tyler. And Schillmiller began a relationship with a young woman named Denali Bremer, 18 years old from Alaska. And he began this relationship as Tyler, and he sent Denali photos of another person that he said were him, but actually, in fact, were not him. This is standard catfishing stuff. Quickly, the relationship progresses, right? They start sending each other I love you messages and Mm. calling each other babe and all that. Typical 18-year-old dumb stuff, right? (laughs) You're such such an old softy, Joe. Exactly. (laughs) No, no, this is exactly what I would have done at 18, too. I mean, I'm not not saying saying these people are idiots because of this. I'm just saying this is just the way 18-year-olds are. Yeah, okay. (laughs) And it's it's okay. But eventually, this is where it becomes not okay. Shill Miller tries to get Denali to commit murder and sexual assault and send him the photos and videos of the crimes. Mm. And he promises her... $9 $9 million, right? Because he's allegedly a millionaire. He's posing as a millionaire. He has tons of money. So allegedly, Denali shot her best friend, Cynthia Hoffman, who was 19 years old in a park in Alaska for this. And it was not until after she committed this terrible crime, the murder of her friend, that she found out that she'd been catfished by Shill Miller. Hmm. This is just awful. Yeah, it's mind boggling. I don't understand. It is. I don't understand. I don't understand either. Was it the promise of money? I, I guess money and love, right? I guess. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's the, normally we see romance scams where it's just give me your money. Yeah. Not 
go out and kill somebody. That's just terrible. Right. The article talks about Ahmed Banafa, who's a professor and cybersecurity expert from San Jose University. And he's talking about the way young people interact with the internet. Internet predators are everywhere, but young people always aren't tuned into the red flags because so many of the relationships are online that they don't think to question the validity or the veracity or whatever of the people they're talking to. Mm, because being online is, is so reflexive to them. Correct. It feels completely natural. They're digital natives. Mm -hmm. And there's a blurred line between real life and, and virtual life. And yeah. they make the jump between the two worlds without realizing how risky it is to do that. Mm -hmm. Of course, old guys like us, <laughs> right, <laughs> yeah. realize that online there's no way to verify who's on the other end. Right. We're much more skeptical I right. Because naturally, we're... Yeah, and these these younger people will become more skeptical when they become victimized by these things. Right, as um, the weight of the world crushes their spirit. <laughs> yes, exactly. With all these different capabilities that we have with Photoshop and creating filters and, and even with... What's the site? The, uh, there's the deep fakes. Not, the, yeah, yeah that's, deep fakes. Yeah. This person does not exist.com. Oh, right, right. Right. I can create a completely fictitious persona and people will be none the wiser. Nathan Wensler is quoted in the article as well. He's from Moss Adams. It's hard for young people to see the red flags, he says, and that they are so used to communicating over the technology. When someone reaches out to them online, they don't think much of it because everybody does this. Additionally, huge data breaches that have come out have made it more possible for me to pose as someone you might know, right? Mm, because mm -hmm. I have all this information on you. I can go out and say, I know Dave. I know where Dave lives. I know who Dave's parents are, his wife is. I can convince Dave that I know him that we've talked before because I can ask him about his wife. Mm -hmm. You can make the catfish really convincing right. just by tossing in little random details that are that are true. Right, exactly, that, and that you'll identify and latch onto. Mm -hmm. So, of course, whenever I talk about something as terrible as this, what do you do? The, the article has a couple of things that we've talked about before. Be wary of someone who's online that wants to switch to a different media. That means like if you're on a Tinder dating site, be wary of somebody who wants to quickly move that off Tinder and onto text messaging because that's out of the dating app's control, mm. right? Or, or if they want to move it from Facebook to text messaging or really if the one that is in the article they talk about is, is Snapchat because Snapchats will disappear after a period of time. Mm, you mm -hmm. won't be able to see them anymore. So the forensic evidence may be gone. I'm going to bet it probably still exists on Snapchat servers just because I don't have any faith in social media companies. <laughs> right, <laughs> like, right. But on the phones, they're gone. Watch for people who ask to meet you way too quickly or seem to get attached very early on. That's another red flag. It also helps to do some cross-referencing. Whenever someone sends me a friend request, if I don't know them on Facebook, I start asking around, who is this person? It seems to me, and like in this case, if, if someone were actually a millionaire, right. millionaires tend to leave paths behind. Right, that, you they know, big footprints. Donations and things, you know, whatever. I mean, yeah. They, yeah, it's probably not hard to look someone up. It should be easy to find that A person. successful person. They own property usually. Right, right. Find them in a database somewhere. Yep. From a parental standpoint, keep the communication open, be engaged, and understand the technology that your kids are using. And I'll add this, instill in your children an inherent distrust of all things online, if not just an inherent distrust of all things in humanity. <laughs> some, some healthy skepticism. Right. Yeah. <laughs> a, a big, healthy dose of skepticism. Like sharing a story like this opens your kids up to the fact that this is a possibility. Right. Because Absolutely. I think for many of us, when you hear a story like this and you wonder, how could this even be possible? How could someone convince another person to do such a horrible thing? Right. Uh, with a best friend. I mean, there's so many unbelievable uh, and bad elements to this, and yet it's true. Uh, well, yeah, it's terrible. And yeah. it's sad. All these people's lives are ruined, and the family of Miss Hoffman will never be the same again. It's un unspeakable horrors. Yeah. I, I guess you have to wonder what motivates uh, the instigator of this. Uh, yeah. What, yeah. Just, what makes Shill Miller do this? Yeah. Does he think that it won't happen? Does he think he's just trolling somebody? I, I don't get this at all. This would be something I, I don't know that I'd be able to live with if it was something I had done. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Awful. All right. Well, uh, certainly a cautionary tale. Tough one to, to think about. Next week, I'm going to do something brighter. <laughs> well, I, I am going to uh, switch gears and okay. uh, some, do something a lot lighter. Okay, good. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is about a Chinese shoe company that tricked people into swiping an Instagram ad by placing a fake strand of hair on the image of their shoes. <laughs> This is brilliant. Yeah. So, <laughs> so 
So imagine you're scrolling along on Instagram. I don't know about you. I I am not an Instagram uh, user. I very I, rarely use it. Yeah. So uh, you're you're scrolling along, and uh, this image and ad comes up for some shoes. It says eighty percent off on these shoes, and and but there on the image, there's a big old chunk of hair. Right. What are you going to do, right? You're going to swipe that, try to get rid of that piece of hair. And these folks did it on purpose to get people to swipe the image and move on to, I guess, the next stage of the ad to visit right. their website. <laughs> yeah. There's a subreddit called Mildly Infuriating. And <laughs> this came, this popped up on there. According to Instagram, they have taken down the ad and they've banned the company from ever advertising on the platform again. So oh. this plan backfired on them, I suppose. <laughs> good, good luck with that. Yeah. Yeah. It's <laughs> funny. I mean, the reactions to this, are like, like you said, People are saying, this is actually kind of brilliant. Right. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I, I have an appreciation for it. Right. One Reddit user left us with some words to live by. He said, always blow, never swipe. <laughs> Sage advice. That. <laughs> there you go. Well, and, you know, don't don't leave fingerprints either. So there you it, go. It's funny that you mentioned Reddit. <laughs> there used to be on our creepy. There used to be like a stain image that wouldn't move. Oh, it's not there anymore. But it it had caused me to touch my monitor and try to wipe a stain off of it, oh. <laughs> only to realize that there is no stain on the monitor. So you'd be scrolling, but the stain would stay. The stain would stay, stay. exactly. Oh, that's it was good. it was a very mm -hmm. nicely designed piece of dynamic HTML. <laughs> um, right, right. I think I realized it when I moved it to another one of my monitors and saw that the stain was the same, yeah. exactly the same. Right. I mean, it was really well done. Out, out, damn spot. Right. Yeah. <laughs> But this, using that technology for an ad swipe, that's brilliant. Yeah. I like that a lot. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, those are our stories. Joe, it's time to move on to our catch of the day. Joe, our catch of the day comes to us from the folks over at 419 Eater. It's a website we've talked about before. Yes. They specialize in stringing along these scammers. We don't have time to do the whole thing here, but I've just got some highlights from this one. This is a good one. There's a little bit of everything here, uh, some scamming, and of course, an opportunity to do ridiculous accents. Excellent. So, <laughs> so I will have you kick it off. You play the part of the scammer here. Go ahead. Okay. Dear sir, madam. My name is Atuku Ali, a seasoned geologist of Nigerian descent with about 20 years working experience with many reputable geophysical firms. I am 43 years old and a native of Yoruba. In the course of my job as a geologist, I stumbled into a place called Igu in Edo state of Nigeria. It is undoubtedly a land naturally endowed with lots of precious solid minerals in abundant supply. The locals of this place do not happen to know the vast potentials of these minerals. A vast majority of them are illiterate people, which has goaded me into establishing a solid mining industry. These minerals include calcite, dolomite, felspar, barite, benthonite, kaolin, etc. Quite frankly, these minerals happen to be in very high demand here in Nigeria and other countries companies never cease to place demand on them locally. The irony is the people do not know just how lucrative the business can be. So many products can be manufactured from these minerals, products like petroleum, addictives, <laughs> marble, tiles, ceiling, boards, paint, rubber, carpets, toothpaste, glass, cement, and for drilling. Having said all this, it is clear that the venture would be very profitable and rewarding I have invested so much here on my own to make the necessary leap I need, but I would need a partner with whom we can jointly continue because I am almost running out of funds and more fund is needed to carry on. I would appreciate a partner who is God fearing and dedicated to join me in establishing this industry. I look forward to hearing from you soon so we can speedily commence work. May God bless you. Mm -hmm. And he signs it. Atiku Ali, which mm -hmm. is a different spelling from the first one he said. Well, maybe he just mistyped it. Uh -huh. His own name. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so here comes the fun response from the folks at 419 Eater. 
Dear Mr. Akitu, your message about the minerals in Nigeria has come to me. Please forgive my English not good. I am from Sicily, Italy. I speak Italian. I live in England only little time. I use dictionary to help write this to you. My name is a pizza pepperoni. I am from business family. We famous for food and restaurants. Many good Italian food named after my grandfather, uncle, etc. I want to move into other business. I find commodities for clients. I have client looking for very rare material. It name dilithium. <laughs> it very valuable. Have you dilithium? My client from Big Federation. <laughs> They want much dilithium. If you have big supply of dilithium, I use family money to begin a mine. Then we supply dilithium to Federation for many monies. If you're interested, please reply. Grazie, pizza pepperoni. Good day, pizza pepperoni. I got your mail. I promise to be loyal and faithful to you if we can work together as one with one mind. The mineral dilithium is very expensive to get, but it can be fetched out from the site but will include much money, which I will need your assistance. But for others, like the white gold is available now in stock. Kindly tell me whatever way you know we can go about this, but as I am concerned, we can get it. I wait to hear from you immediately. Thanks. Ali. And it goes on from there. We'll have the link in the show notes. An elaborate stringing along, including mob bosses. Does they, he ever look for trilithium? He, that would be a red they, flag for they, me because yeah. that puts out stars. Well, they bring, they bring up the, their Ferengis <laughs> and right. um, yeah, there's a, a mob boss and yeah, this it's it's a good one. So I, awesome. I do recommend uh, go check out the original article from 419 Eater. As always, uh, some entertaining stuff. So appreciate it. Uh, hat tip to them for the work they do. It's brilliant. Yeah. So that is our catch of the day. Uh, coming up next, we have my interview with Michael Coates. He is the former chief information security officer at Twitter. And these days he heads up a company called Altitude Networks. But first, a word from our sponsors at Know Before. And what about the biggest, tastiest piece of fish bait out there? If you said, A, my late husband wished to share his oil fortune with you, you've just swallowed a Nigerian print scam, but most people don't. If you chose door B, please read important message from HR. Well, you're getting warmer, but that one was only number 10 on the list. But pat yourself on the back if you picked C, a delivery attempt was made. That one, according to the experts at Know Before, was the number one come on for spam email in the first quarter of 2018. What's that? You picked D, take me to your leader? No, sorry, that's what space aliens say. But it's unlikely you'll need that one unless you're doing the day the earth stood still at a local dinner theater. If you want to stay on top of fishing's twists and turns, the new school security awareness training from our sponsors at Know Before can help. That's K-N-O-W-B-E, the number four, dot com, slash fish test. Joe, I recently had the pleasure of speaking with Michael Coates. Uh, as I mentioned before, he formerly was the chief information security officer at Twitter and was also the head of security at Mozilla. He has quite a lot of experience dealing with scams and pen testing and things like that. Uh, so here's my conversation with Michael Coates. You know, one of the things that really attracted me to both Mozilla and Twitter was its positive place in the world, its ability to empower people, you know, fighting for the user. And, you know, at Mozilla, when I was there, we had you know, about 400 million users of Firefox. And, you know, we focused on both browser security, the controls to make it so if you went to a malicious website, you know, your browser wouldn't be compromised. Also, the security of our systems, of our workstations, of our websites. One of the things that's really interesting about working at Mozilla is because it's a community-driven organization with lots of volunteers and an open source project, you have people contributing code that may or may not be employees that may work on their personal laptop that are located anywhere in the world. And how do you start to think about how do we make that code secure? How do we think about security in that that mode that is so different than every other normal company setup, as I put in air quotes? Yeah, there we had just, an, again, a fascinating and talented team that focused both on Firefox, the web browser, something called Firefox OS at the time, an operating system for mobile, infrastructure, and uh, workstation security. And how did you come at that task or that challenge of having bits of code coming from so many different places? In some regards, we try and set up developers for success by educating them on the best practices and ways to do things securely. And, and that 
helps, uh, but we have to realize that education can only go so far. On the other side of things, we also heavily relied on something called fuzzing. And depending on you know audiences' familiarity with that, the idea there is to take different parts of your application after the code's all been compiled and running and send it all sorts of different characters and types of data, both hundreds of the letter A or you know tens of thousands of this type of character or that. And through that exercise and test different paths through the code to find when there might be a problem. And so we had some really cool fussing technology that uh, members of the, the team had both built and integrated from other open source projects. And so that was kind of a, a pretty clever and effective way to keep testing the browser security. And now you're the co-founder and CEO at Altitude Networks. And, and what are you taking on there? Yeah, one of the things I've learned along the way is that technology and the security of it is hard at a you know technical or academic level. But also, it's very hard at a human level. Most of the security controls that companies and teams have built over the years don't give fair consideration to the, the human and what they want to accomplish in their natural path uh, of action. And one of the areas that, as a result, has become very tricky is when companies start to use cloud applications that are designed for employees to share data. And while the technical security controls of that software is great, people inevitably make mistakes, or maybe they're malicious or taking some questionable actions. And so you see situations where people put company data into Google Drive, and then they share it with the whole world or share it with their personal account, or maybe the wrong person inside the company. And in a one-off example, that's not too hard to deal with. But when all of your company data is in there by design in one of those platforms, and people share stuff hundreds of times a day, that gets really tricky. And so how do you mirror together the security component that you need with the reality of how humans behave? And that's the problem we're going after. And one I felt specifically at Twitter, and I know my peers feel, how do you protect data in this new paradigm of a cloud sharing world? And so far, it's been a lot of fun. It's interesting to me because my take is that really in the past year or two, it seems as though there's been a shift in emphasis from perhaps this belief that the technology is is all we need to keep us secure. And it seems to me like there's a greater understanding that there really is a human element here and it requires our attention. Yeah, I've, I've been talking about this quite a bit over the, over the last year as well. I did a, a keynote at the OWASP conference last year talking about usability of security. Because as we've grown up in the security profession, we first started on that academic completeness because the work we were doing was very hidden from humans. It was on protocols. It was on encryption algorithms. But now the work we do in security is very front and center to the user. Like, how do you decide how to authenticate? What is this notion of a a username and password or a two-factor or a code you get on your phone? And we're running straight into the, the normal user desires of, of a person. Like, I just want to do this. I just want to go to a website and buy this. I just want to check sports or I just want to see my bank info. And just like they want to just get in their car and go somewhere, they don't want to flip switches to turn on safety mechanisms or be asked questions. They mm. expect that with a good quality product that it just works. And so that's the challenge we have to work through of how do we make security uh, just work for humans when it is so front and center in, integrated into everything they do. Yeah. What advice do you have for folks out there in terms of, you know, based on the broad experiences you've had, how can people best protect themselves from things like phishing and social engineering? I guess I'll say luckily, there's really only a handful of things you can do, and that will set you apart dramatically from most other people. One, understand what a password manager is and use one. Number two, for your main email and for your bank logins, understand and set up two-factor authentication. And then there's only a couple other things you really need to focus on. Next, when your machine says you have updates, apply them. Um, you're just a sitting duck if you're browsing the web and you have not applied the updates both to your operating system and your browser. Those two things, if you don't do them, you'll just be walking down the street, so to speak, and be compromised because there is malware everywhere to some degree and you need to be patched. But if you do those things... A password manager, two-factor authentication, and update your browser and operating system, you're going to be in a really good space compared to everyone else. And lastly, if somebody calls you on the phone and says you've been hacked, imagine that they're a bad guy because 100% they are a bad guy. Microsoft (laughs) does not call you. Apple does not call you to tell you you've been hacked. It is social engineering. I've done those exact same things. Uh, So don't fall for those. Yeah. Don't click the links, right? 
Oh man. Well, the links, that's a tricky one. Um, <laughs> if, if you've patched your machine, I mean, yeah, if you, if you get funky links in your email, yeah, you should be wary of those. That's for sure. Now you have some experience yourself in doing some social engineering. What stories can you share with us when it comes to that? Yeah, I was fortunate early in my career to be in the role where I was the bad guy. I would hack into companies technically or through social engineering as a test to show them this is what can happen and let's you know, shore up our defenses. And the social engineering part in particular was really fascinating because it boils down to really human behavior. In many cases, I would call someone on the phone out of the blue and manufacture a problem that they were in create a sense of stress, create a sense of urgency. And then I would swoop in in that same conversation, save the day as long as they just sort of gave me their password or something so I could help them out. And so suddenly I was a good guy. And, mm. and this was really fascinating. So for example, imagine I call you or, or someone else, you can imagine someone else about 11.30 a.m. I say, hey, you know, I'm working with IT. I name your IT person's name because it's not hard to figure out. You know, security is really important. You've probably heard a lot about that recently. We want to make sure everybody's up to date and patched with everything. I'm going to walk you through a few steps to make sure you're in tip top shape. It's going to take about two hours. You know, are you in front of your computer because we're going to go ahead and get started. Mm. Now, <laughs> I, I pick I pick 11.30 a.m. for a specific reason. And I tell them two hours for another reason. Because at 11.30 a.m., most people are thinking, where am I going to go to lunch? Mm -hmm. And they're really excited about that because it's a nice break. And when they hear that two hour thing, it's going to destroy their lunch. So they're conflicted. They're like, oh, yeah, we do talk about security a lot. Uh, I can't really blow this off. Um, you know, whoever's name I dropped, they're going to know. And so now they're a little frustrated. They're like, oh, can I reschedule? What about this? And then I, that's where I start to get a little pushy. Like, no, we really need to do this now. It's very important. I wouldn't want to put you on the, the list of machines that I couldn't blah, 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 you know, mm -hmm. pushing on them a little bit. And so then this is where I swoop in. I say, well, you know, I'm not supposed to do this. So here I'm doing a favor for them. But, you know, our executives, we put them on an automatic script that runs overnight. So it logs in through the computers. It runs, it does all the things I'm going to tell you to do. And it does it on their behalf. The only thing I need to do to put you on that same script is to put your information in there so it can log in as you. So if you can give me your username and password, I can put you into the system. It'll run tonight. We'll be all good. And uh, we'll be done. Mm, thank you so much. Yeah. And they are thanking me for me doing something I'm not supposed to, to put them on the exec list. And lo and behold, of course, they give me their password. And what was your success rate with this? I would say, you know, across a few different ploys, it was, it was above 50%. You know, every other call, you would get someone to give you their information, hmm. which, I mean, that's astounding to me. Half yeah. the time I can get a random person to give me their password. Some of the other tricks are building fake websites that look like your company's website. And, and I would tell them, hey, we just want to know if your password's strong. Don't give it to me. That would be insecure. Just enter into this website and tell me what score it gets. And that website, of course, it's at an IP address. So I rattle off some numbers. And most people have seen that and think it's just some internal server. So it makes sense. But it's my website on the web. And um, <laughs> they gave me the score like 82. Is that good? I'm like, yeah, that, that's great. And, you know, on, on the, the way the scoring works, it was like 75 plus the length of password. So, right. Um, but yeah, lo and behold, they've entered their password into my website. I have their password. And I, I remember people saying, hey, I have some other passwords. Should I check those too? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, yeah, go ahead and tell you, what, what are those for sure. again? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wow. And, and so wow. the thing is, like, we can't get on this rant and say, oh, man, these stupid users, users are the weakest link. Instead, we have to, again, look back to things we've talked about before, which is like natural user behavior, a normal pattern of trust and wanting to do the right thing. And so we have to build technology that doesn't let a human mistake be the total point of failure. And that's where two-factor is a good solution. And we have to rely on continual training, which, which is hard to let them know the patterns, to be able to spot them. So when someone says, hey, I'm the CEO and I need all the tax records, you're like, oh, that, that is a ploy that's happening right now. I will not do that. But it's, it's a yeah. really tricky balance. Joe, what do you think? Good interview, Dave. Thanks. I like the idea of working for the security of regular people. Mm -hmm. That then that's that Michael has worked in Mozilla and Twitter. That's pretty much all for regular people. Academic completeness. He used that term in security. I, I like that term. This is one of the things that kind of causes me to bonk heads with other people, particularly with cryptographers. They will view a system as either secure or insecure. If there's any way I can get around it. 
it's insecure. And I like to view security from, and that's true in cryptographic protocols. If there's a way to get around a cryptographic protocol, it's insecure. Right. But I like to view security from the user's perspective and having a list of their behaviors as being more secure or less secure. So right. viewing it as a spectrum. Viewing it as a spectrum. Rather than binary. Right. You are more secure if you do this. You are less secure if you reuse passwords. You're more secure if you don't. Mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing. It's just a way of moving you in the more secure direction. Right. To get your behaviors to move to that end of the spectrum. I'm going to make a statement here that some people might not agree with. But users are always going to bear some level of responsibility for their own security. I think that's just a fact that, that is going to be the case. And Michael talks about the car analogy. People just want to get in the car and go. Well, you still have to put on your seatbelt, mm -hmm. right? There's still something you have to do in order to be more safe than just driving off. If you mm -hmm. don't put on your seatbelt, you're at a much higher risk. That moves you in the less secure direction, right? the less right. safe direction. Mm -hmm. uh, so Michael has four tips that he talks about in the interview. These are not anything that we haven't heard before. When he talks about his social engineering experience, I love the story about manufacturing a problem and then saving a day. This is what happened to Christine Liu that we talked about two episodes ago. Mm -hmm. Somebody called her and manufactured a problem and it cost her a lot of money. His story for asking for a username and password is great. I love this. <laughs> you know, I, I tell the story about my friend who did password auditing 20 years ago, and he said he would just call and get a 50% success rate. Right. And it now you call and you get a 10% success rate. Well, he, Michael has gone back up to a 50% success rate by creating a problem and then solving it for somebody mm -hmm. and just asking for it. Mm -hmm. I also love the idea of collecting username and passwords from a website. And then people go in and say, oh, can I test my other password? Right. That's awesome. <laughs> right. Your That's password, great. Password strength uh, meter. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> the funny thing is there are websites out there like like Troy Hunt has Have I Been Pwned, where you can enter your password and it doesn't send your password across the network. It sends a hash of your password across and gets compared to the database. And I think that Troy's running a, a good service here and I, I don't suspect it of any malicious activity. But here's a great example of using that kind of a paradigm for doing exactly what you would fear it would do. Right, <laughs> right. right. Collecting your password. Right. Uh, taking advantage of people's trust. Again, users aren't stupid, but they do need to be educated. That's my point. And that's what I mean when I say that they're always going to bear some level of responsibility for their own security. Yeah. and But in, at the same time, it, you can set them up for success. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And you should do it. You as a business owner or as you and I as, as security advocates and evangelists should be doing this. And we are doing this. <laughs> there you go. But people should listen to the podcast. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, our thanks to Michael Coates for joining us. Uh, and thanks to you for listening. And of course, we want to thank our sponsors at Know Before. They are the social engineering experts and the pioneers of new school security awareness training. Be sure to take advantage of their free phishing test, which you can find at knowbefore.com slash fish test. Think of Know Before for your security training. We want to thank the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute for their participation. You can learn more at isi.jhu.edu. The Hacking Humans podcast is proudly produced in Maryland at the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our coordinating producer is Jennifer Iben. Our editor is John Petrick. Technical editor is Chris Russell. Our staff writer is Tim Nodar. Our executive editor is Peter Kilpie. I'm Dave Bittner. And I'm Joe Kerrigan. Thanks for listening. 